Okay, welcome back. Uh, we'll continue. Uh, there were no other questions, right, from anybody regarding what we've covered so far? Okay, feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat or even on Google Classroom. I think it's really good to be able to have some place where uh, you are all interacting with one another. So if you have questions, whether it's about something we've done in class or even any comments, anything you're learning, anything like that, feel free to post it on the classroom. Um, and then other students can also learn, other students can respond. Uh, so feel free to do that if you're not able to do it in class uh, while we're on the call. So uh, we'll go on from verse 17 to 24, if someone can read that for us. <clears throat> Uh, verse 17 to 24. But as God has distributed to each one as the Lord has called each one, so let him uh, walk. And so I ordain in all this. Is this actually a reading? Or, sorry, I was not able to hear. This is, I'm ready. Can you hear now? Okay. Hello? Yeah, I'm not able to hear. Is everyone else able to? You're able to hear? Okay, I think my headphones usually decide to stop working somewhere in the middle of class. Okay, uh, you can go ahead and read. I'll just try and uh, fix my uh, my headset, but you can go ahead and read. Thank you. 17 to 24, verses 17 to 24. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is not is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which I, in which he was called. Were you called while uh, while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he he who is called while free is. Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the, in that state in which he was called. Thank you. So, um, I think that last verse kind of summarizes everything that Paul wants to communicate in this whole section. So he's saying, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. So even in the previous part, where he's talking about uh, the marriage, uh, being married, if you're already married uh, to an unbeliever, then stay in that marriage. Uh, so he continues that same thought line from saying, stay in your marriage. He goes into other kinds of situations uh, that you might have been, that these believers might have been in uh, when they heard the gospel. And when they responded and so he's saying whatever situation you were in when you became a believer don't feel the need to change everything and suddenly lead a completely different life he's saying stay wherever you were and continue to live out a life in christ in the context in which you are uh, so that's an important thing for us as well uh, in different ways so we look at all of the examples that he's mentioned and then we can also discuss things that we might experience as when we hear the gospel or when people around us are hearing the gospel what are some things we feel pressurized to uh, change 
right? Because we feel that what what we're doing currently may not be uh, the right way to live as a believer. So, um, so verse seventeen also very important. God has distributed to each one, and the Lord has called each one. So let him work. So each person has a calling and each person has a specific purpose that God has given them. And so we should live out those purposes and live out those callings um, uh, in the context that God has put us in. Uh, we don't have to try and make our lives and our calling uh, or our walk look like another believer's walk. So if we see another friend who is called into full-time ministry, we don't have to feel, oh, um, I also should go into full-time ministry because I'm a believer now. Or um, if we see uh, that somebody else has made some kind of change to their lives, whatever it may be, even if it, they didn't go into full-time ministry, they went into a different kind of work. They changed their work thinking, OK, this is something that God is calling me to. That may not be for everyone. It's for them because God has a purpose and a calling for them. Uh, so for each of us to honor uh, the calling and the gifts that God has given us and to live out our faith in that context is very important. So now Paul goes on to um, explain certain ways in which uh, maybe they were called or they uh, received the gospel when they were in one state, and then he's saying, okay, don't try to change and become something else. Uh, verse 18, he says, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. So just because uh, when you came to faith, uh, you were a Jew and you were circumcised, so that's something that has already been done. Don't try to uh, change any way you can't change your circumcision, right? It's done. It's already done. You can't do anything about it. So don't try to become uncircumcised. Uh, on the other hand, if you were uncircumcised, if you were not a Jew, uh, don't try to now come and follow the law and be circumcised. So that is very clear in the New Testament, where um, the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised. Uh, and he goes on to explain in verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. So that is uh, that is the important thing. So let's not look at outward things. Let's not look at the flesh and what uh, what the external things are that people are doing. Instead, uh, let's look at the heart and let's follow uh, let's follow obediently what God is asking us to do. So those are the things that we should be concerned about. Uh, we should not be concerned about uh, things that are um, not not in uh, not to do with uh, obedience or not to do with uh, the state of our heart. Right, circumcision is just a physical thing. Um, so that that's the difference that he's uh, making between circumcision and following the commandments. Um, verse twenty. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? So the, this very, it's a very beautiful thing that Paul uh, is saying here. So uh, nobody would look at being a slave as being something that you're called to, right? You never think of ourselves as, oh, I'm called to be a slave. Uh, likewise, sometimes we don't look at our work as something we are called to. If we're called to a corporate job or we're called to um, teaching in a school, we don't always look at those things as something that God has called us to. We very easily can do that with ministry, but uh, with jobs outside of the church or outside of uh, this kind of full-time ministry, we sometimes forget that God calls us to those things. Uh, so were you called while well, uh, so remain in the same calling in which you were called, right? So there was a calling and you were called to Christ in that context in which you were. So were you called while a slave? Then don't be concerned about it. But if you can be free, then try and be free. So he's saying, okay, for someone who is a slave, you are under uh, someone else's authority. If there is opportunity for you to be free, 
then use that opportunity. But don't uh, don't think that you need to be free just because you become a believer. That's not the reason. Your uh, if you want to be free for other reasons, yeah. But don't uh, let that become something that's bothering you as you are following Christ. You can continue to follow Christ and be a slave. Um, so verse 22, for he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he is called while free is Christ's slave. So uh, he's differentiating between the physical state of the person and the spiritual state of the person. Right? So even if you are a slave in the physical realm, you're spiritually free in Christ. And uh, likewise, if uh, you are free in the physical realm, you're spiritually a slave to Christ in that you are fully submitted and given over to Christ. Uh, so the same thing that he was talking about circumcision and uncircumcision and the commandments of God, uh, the spiritual versus the physical. So don't be concerned about the physical things. Be concerned about how do you live out your spiritual reality uh, in your everyday work. Uh, verse 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Um, so uh, this seems a little bit disconnected from the rest of what he's talking about because He's talking about something else and then he suddenly goes back to this. But if we uh, look previously, he he said the same thing, right? You were bought at a price. Uh, so honor God with your bodies. Um, so he's using that uh, terminology of slavery where people were bought. Uh, money was given and the person was bought to become a slave. Uh, so in the same way, we have been bought. Uh, with the blood of Christ. So the blood of Christ was used to pay for us uh, so that we can become Christ's servants. Uh, and so we should be fully loyal to Christ. That should be where our allegiance is. Um, so be fully loyal to Christ. Do not uh, serve other people. Do not become slaves of men. Uh, you already have a master. Christ is your master. Uh, do not be enslaved by anyone else. Um, we so Paul continues to talk about from here. He's continuing to talk about uh, sex and uh, marriage and all of that. So verses twenty-five to thirty-five. Uh, if somebody can read that for us. Yes, First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 to 35. Now concerning virgins, I have uh, no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do you do not seek to be loosed? Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is so short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. Those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he is married, cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman 
cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in the body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a lease on you, but what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So, um, so again, he uh, he talks about uh, speaking from his own wisdom or own understanding of God's will. Uh, he says, "I have no commandment from the Lord. I'm giving judgment as uh, one whom God Himself has made trustworthy." So, uh, God, in God's mercy, He has given me this work of uh, teaching you, of uh, exhorting you, of uh, helping you walk uh, in obedience to God's word. And so in that responsibility that God has given me, th this is what I'm teaching you. Uh, and he starts to talk uh, specifically about those who are unmarried, right? Uh, virgins, so people who had were still unmarried who were single. Uh, so he's addressing every part of the church. So for this, he talks about the uh, people who were uh, who were not yet married, uh, but then he, then he talks about the married. Now he's talking about the virgins. Uh, so people who might have been younger and starting to think about getting married. Uh, so he's talking to all of these different people and uh, very fully addressing uh, this topic of marriage, right? From everyone's perspective, from uh, we'll even as we go on to read, he'll start. He'll talk even from the parents' perspective. So uh, everyone's questions are being answered, kind of from the church uh, with regard to marriage. So um, in verse twenty-six, uh, I suppose therefore that is good because of the present distress, right? So it isn't clear what the present distress is, uh, but if we, as we continue to read, um, he talks about the form of this world is passing away. Um, and in verse 29, he says, the time is short. Uh, so it, it seems like um, his focus is on, OK, we are at, uh, which, which is very true throughout the New Testament, uh, that the focus was on Jesus's return. Right? Everyone was thinking about Christ coming back. So let's not uh, get involved in the affairs of this world. Let's focus on Christ's return. Uh, so that is one aspect of it. The other aspect is that there was persecution um, that the church was experiencing. So uh, he might also be referencing some of that persecution and saying, uh, you are having this kind of trouble, so don't uh, add to it by getting married and then you also have to take care of a family, you also have to face persecution, like all of these things uh, will just be a lot of responsibility on you. Um, so that persecution was uh, what the church was experiencing at that time and what also they expected as uh, the end of time, as uh, they were preparing for Christ's return expecting that persecution would increase and so uh, in that context he's saying don't uh, worry about marriage instead focus on christ um, now we can see even the old testament there is similar teaching if uh, anyone would be willing to read from uh, the book of jeremiah jeremiah 16 2. Jeremiah chapter 16. Yes, verse 2. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place. Okay, thank you. You can actually uh, continue. Um, yeah, let's just read till maybe verse 4 to give us some context. So, Jeremiah 16, 2 to 4. For this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in this land and about this woman who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. 
and they will die of deadly diseases they will not be mourned or buried but will be like dung like on the ground they will perish by sword and famine and their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals okay so uh, there is going to be a time of suffering for these people who live in that um, in that place and so god is saying do not do not get married do not have children because there is going to be this suffering and uh, all of the uh, so it's saying specifically about uh, yeah the children the parents everyone is going to experience this suffering so don't get married don't have children in this place uh, but we can also go into jeremiah 29 Uh, and maybe read from verse five, uh, five and six. Houses and settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. do not decrease thank you so um here we can see even in jeremiah that there is a time to refrain from marriage to refrain from uh building a family and there is a time to do it um right so like ecclesiastes talks about there's a time for and a time and a season for everything so paul is saying in this season uh based on what you're experiencing right now it's better not to get married okay and uh, then he gives again he continues to explain uh, based on your situation what can you do so uh, if you're already uh, married then don't seek to be unmarried verse 27 uh if you're unmarried then don't seek to be married so whatever situation you're in be happy be content with where you are don't try to change your situation um verse 29 so he explains again the time is short uh so even if you are married live as if you are not married uh and all of these things so if you're weeping uh it, if you are a person who is weeping for some reason live as if you are not weeping if you are rejoicing live as if you are not rejoicing uh if you are someone who possesses a lot live as if you don't possess anything so uh, basically saying don't be concerned about the things of this world don't be concerned about these physical things uh instead um be uh be fully focused on the spiritual not not to say we forget our physical needs we not to say that we forget uh that all of these things are real but he's saying the time is short the, this world is passing away so don't live as if this world is our eternity okay that's his main um point uh so verse 31 is where he says is the form of this world is passing away and i want you to be without care okay so then he also explains what does it mean to be uh somebody who is living with the concerns of this world so uh someone who is unmarried is able to fully focus on the lord because they don't have to think about the like uh, a spouse or children they don't have those responsibilities uh but someone who is married has additional responsibilities that they are taking on uh and they will have to start to think about those things so it will be uh in a way taking them away from focusing on the lord okay now uh, some uh, the ideal would be if we could get married and we are able to focus even more on the lord uh, which is a great thing but uh, the reality of marriage and having children is that there it does require a lot of our energy uh, it requires a lot of our time our focus and so he's saying uh, it's better not to take all of those things on instead just focus on the lord um again verse 34 there's a difference between a wife and a virgin uh, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the lord uh, and she cares about being holy in body and in spirit but the married woman cares about 
uh, cares about the world, but the world, uh, how he explains that is that she cares about uh, her husband. She has to, she thinks about how to please her husband. So uh, differentiating between the present world and the uh, our eternal reality with Christ. Um, and then verse 35, I say this for your own profit, not to control you. So I'm not trying to control what you do, whether you get married, whether you don't get married. Uh, I'm just uh, giving you some advice to help you serve God without having any kind of distraction. OK, so um, his main goal is saying, OK, do whatever will help you be fully committed to God, fully dedicated to God. Uh, and if there are things that uh, may come and distract you from that, then it's better to avoid it. Uh, but he's already prefaced this with, if this is a gift from God, OK? And he's also saying, OK, don't be, I don't have a mindset of, I need to change my current situation. Be content wherever you are. So. Uh, if you're unmarried, be content with being unmarried. If you're married, be content with being married. Uh, don't uh, try to, yeah, don't don't constantly be looking at changing and doing something else from what you have at the present. Okay, so we also want to be clear that uh, Paul is not forbidding marriage, uh, right? So um, if we read in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3, Paul talks about forbidding marriage as a doctrine of demons. So it's very clear that, first of all, he's not commanding them to do anything. Right? Like he said, this is just something that I am saying for your good uh, for this reason. So for us to understand that, that it's not a command to stay single. Uh, we'll go on to verse 36 to 40. Someone could read that, please. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses uh, 36 to 40. But if a man thinks he's behaving improperly toward his virgin, if he's past the flower of youth, thus it must be let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. So only in the law, but she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the spirit of God. Thank you. So here, um, there is some confusion between what uh, Paul is talking about. So even translators uh, will give us two options. So there are some tra translations that uh translated as a young man who's engaged to a young lady to be married so it's saying like if you are engaged to uh someone to be married and you feel that uh you need to marry them that you are uh you're not doing the right thing by staying unmarried then you get married to them um so that is one way in which it's translated. Another way in which it's translated is a father who has a young daughter uh, who is getting older in age. And so he's thinking about uh, getting her married, right? Because in that, uh, in the Jewish custom, it was still the parents who were uh, very involved in getting their children married. So some translations 
will choose one way. Some translations go the other way. And uh, there are some translations that keep both those uh, options. So they say they choose one translation, but like the NIV will give you one translation, but also give you the footnote saying, uh, this is the other way of uh, interpreting or translating this text. Um, so let's just read that NIV translation. Um, I can read it for us. So in the text, it says, if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do, uh, do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. Uh, so in this case, it's where there are two people who are engaged, right? And uh, the man has a lot of these desires. Uh, so he has a sexual desire within him and uh, he's not able to control it. And he feels that he's not, uh, yeah, he's not able to control it. So he's not acting honorably towards that, uh, the uh, woman that he is engaged to. So in that case, don't act out on your uh, sexual desires outside of marriage. Instead, get married. So you're already engaged to be married. So get married instead of having all of these desires and acting in a way that is uh, not right by God's will. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so he says he's not sinning. They should get married. But on the other hand, if in his own mind he feels that uh, he's able to control his those desires and there is no uh, requirement so, uh, between him and the girl that they should get married, then don't get married in that case. So in that case, you can just, uh, both of you remain unmarried. Um, on the other hand, there is the other translation of the father with the daughter. So we we'll read that translation. Uh, it says, if anyone thinks he is not treating his daughter properly, and if she is getting along in years, or if her passions are too strong and he feels she ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. He should let her get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind to keep the virgin unmarried, this man also does the right thing. So then he who gives his virgin in marriage does right, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. So uh, this is where... Uh, a father has a daughter who's getting older and it feel and he feels that she should get married um, and that her she herself has these passions that need to be fulfilled, then he can give her in marriage. So in both cases he's saying it's not a sin for them to get married. Uh, but if we don't get married, it's a better thing because uh, like he's talked about before, you can focus on serving the Lord. Um, so let's go on to the last two verses. Um, so he says, so marriage is limited to our lives here on earth. If one of the spouse dies, then the other one is free to uh, get married to someone else if they want. But his advice uh, is that they don't get married. It's better if they remain single. Uh, and then he ends saying, I also think I have the spirit of God. So uh, this is, I feel whatever I'm sharing with you is coming from uh, the spirit's leading or the wisdom that the Holy Spirit has given me. Okay. Um, there is a note here. Uh, you get First Timothy 5, if someone can turn to First Timothy 5. So verses 5 and verse 14, if someone can read. The widow who is really in need and left all alone 
puts a hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. And fourteen. Yes, first. So, uh, thank you. Uh, you read verse five, right? Can you also yes. read verse fourteen, please? Yes, yes. Uh, so I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Thank you. So here we see again, Paul is talking about this thing of being widowed. Uh, in one case, he's saying it's better to remain unmarried. That is for a widow who is older, because then if they're already old, they can instead spend their time in prayer and fasting. On the other hand, if they're a younger woman, and uh, it's more likely that you're going to have um, more opportunities, uh, like more of a desire uh, to um, to uh, to engage in sex, or you have that kind of passion within you, then it's better for you to have children and to focus on managing the home. So he's also talking about the context of uh, the young uh, women who are unmarried are uh, getting involved in gossip and are basically they, they don't have anything useful that they're doing with their free time. So instead, it's better to spend your time taking care of a family and doing that. Uh, spending it on more constructive things. Um, so with that, we come to the end of uh, this whole section on uh, sexual morality. So uh, it started with that uh, that sin in the church and how sin, sexual immorality within the church had to be dealt with. Now, we understand the Corinthian context, right? It was uh city known for sexual sin because of the um the temple prostitutes that were present there because it was a very cosmopolitan place of uh so many people coming in and going out there was so much trade there was so much commercial activity that was going on there it was um yeah so uh, sex became something that was very common and it was um corrupted Right in that uh, context, in that city, uh, sex was very far away from what God wanted it to be, and so this teaching is very important for this church that finds itself in that context. Uh, so, starting with that sexual sin in the church, Paul uh, then talks about what is the right place for sex. So he talks about marriage, and then he explains what marriages should look like, and then he also. Uh, affirms that singleness is something from God. Uh, in fact, he encourages singleness if someone has such a gift of self-control uh, that is given by the Holy Spirit. If they have that gift and that ability to remain unmarried, then he encourages that. Um, so it's a very uh, complete teaching on uh, sex and what is God's purpose and God's desire for sex. With that, we finish that section and we start the next section, which is chapter eight. Okay, and from here, Paul moves into another issue that was prevalent in the culture, which was idol worship. And uh, because they had idol worship in their culture, they also had to deal with the foods that were offered to idols. Uh, what would they do when food was offered to idols? How should they respond when uh, somebody uh, gave them food that was offered to idols. Um, so we can start uh, from verses 1 to 3 of chapter 8. Before we do that, was there any questions or should we can we move into chapter 8? Any questions, thoughts, insights? Okay, let's uh, move on to chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, if somebody would be willing to read that. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. 
But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Thank you. So, um, so when Paul talks about ideals, there are two kinds of ideals that scripture talks about. One is uh, the physical um, objects that people were worshipping. Right? They uh, consider those objects to be God and they were worshipping them. On the other hand, there were idols um, that uh, were in the heart. So idols uh, of uh, whatever it is, anything that was taking them away from God. Uh, so when uh, even in the Old Testament, so many times uh, where God talks to the people of Israel and says, you have committed adultery, you have gone away from me. Um, there were many times when they were going to worship idols, uh, but they were also just turning away from God's law. They were not being obedient to what God had asked them to do. They were going and doing uh, whatever the culture around them was doing. So that is an I other form of idol worship, which is not a physical object, but it's just a turning away from God and following other things. Uh, so in this context, uh, very clearly is that physical um, object that is being worshipped and which was very common in Corinth. Uh, so there was food that was offered to idols uh, in that culture. Okay, and that food that was offered, uh, the whatever was left over from the sacrifice was either eaten in the temple itself or it was sold in the marketplace. So there are these two scenarios that Paul will address. Uh, one is if you are uh, offered meat in or near the temple. So this meat that has been sacrificed and someone is sharing that meat with you. Uh, the other hand, if there's meat that is being sold in the market, uh, which has come from the temple sacrifices, what should we do in that case? Um, will you know whether it's offered to idols and what do you do? Should you buy that meat or not? Um, so his first uh, statement, there is, we, uh, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Um, so this is a very um, important thing for us today, I think, because knowledge is abounding, right? right. Anything we want to know uh, is just at our fingertips. You just have to Google it and you have the you have answers to the questions you uh, want to have. And even uh, in scripture where it talks about the end times, it says that knowledge will increase, but uh, there will be a lack of love. Uh, so this is what uh, Paul is talking about. There's something for us as a church to be very, very careful about because we are living in an age where knowledge is increasing. Uh, and it's so easy for us to become proud about the knowledge that we have. Uh, but knowledge is not what we are after. We, uh, What is the first commandment and the greatest commandment? It's to love, right? It's not to know. Uh, it's to love God and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So um, <clears throat> for us to keep that at the center of our pursuits, even whether we are here getting a degree, whatever it is, uh, we are seeking knowledge, of course. But what is the end goal? Is the goal uh, to love God more and to love our neighbors more, to love them better? Uh, or is it just to have more understanding, more knowledge? Uh, so to recognize that knowledge in itself is um, is not what God desires. He wants us to love. So love, uh, knowledge pops up, but love edifies. So whereas one thing, which is knowledge, makes you proud, love builds others up. Instead of, uh, instead of raising yourself up, you are raising others up around you. And that's the difference between knowledge and love. Uh, verse 2, if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. So someone who thinks they have a lot of knowledge is actually deceived uh, because there's always more to know. Right? That is something uh, else that we see around us. Uh, is this is one side of there's so much knowledge, but on the other hand, it's a lot of like we don't know. 
like if even if you're looking at a lot of research the final conclusion is like it could be this or it could be that uh, there's no firm answers to anything so even when we are seeking knowledge to come to it with humility of this is what we know but uh, we don't know everything there's still more to be known um, and then verse three if anyone loves god this one is known by him and i love this uh, verse because it's a big contrast between the first verse and verse three uh, verse one is where we are seeking knowledge and uh, we are pursuing it uh, verse three is we are just simply loving god and god knows us Rather than us knowing things, God knows us. And that is a much better place uh, to be at. Uh, so we are, we have another minute. Uh, but this, uh, these three verses sets the context for what Paul is going to share uh, going from here. So he's going to talk about idol worship. And uh, there's one group of people who are really proud about their knowledge that idols are not true gods. right? So they feel very confident that they can eat food offered to idols because it's nothing. Idols are nothing. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's another group of people who maybe lack that kind of knowledge, uh, who still view idols as, uh, as something where even if they don't view it as God, they see some power in those idols. And so they don't want to eat food offered to idols, or they think eating food offered to idols is participating in that power that is not um, that is not of Christ. And so this is the big debate of which group is right, uh, and how do we as a church, so th both these groups exist in the church, so how do we uh, deal with this issue of eating food offered to idols. Uh, so we'll continue from there next week. Um, I think I've received most assignments. If you have not yet submitted your assignment, uh, you can still submit it. There is There was the deadline given, so uh, I will score based on people meeting the deadline. But uh, for those who have not yet submitted it, you can still submit it and I'll score you based on whenever you've submitted it. Um, yeah, thank you. Have a good week. See you next Monday.